This hasn't happened in Japan in decades and decades. Fumio, the present prime minister, is a very solid guy. Japan is a very, very stable ally. It is clearly now the will of the parliamentary conservative party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new prime minister. Two world leaders gone, Boris Johnson from Scandal and Shinzo Abe from an assassin's bullet. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on how we can have a recession with full employment. It's not something we have ever seen uh, before. And Deborah Jackson of Plum Alley on what a downturn could mean for venture capital. Will the market be there? In my opinion, look at, look at history. influential leaders left the world stage this week. First, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson quit after a soap opera played out at number 10 Downing Street. I abhor uh, bullying and abuse of power anywhere uh, in Parliament, uh, in this party or in any other party. None of that explains why he promoted him in the first place. I'm not going to trivialise uh, what happened. It's absolutely true, Mr Speaker, that it was raised with, raised with me. I greatly regret that he continued uh, in office ultimately leading to Prime Minister Johnson stepping down and triggering a search for a new government. And then, at the end of the week, an assassin took the life of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Prime Minister Abe was an extraordinary partner. Um, and someone who clearly was a great leader for Japan. NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg said that he would welcome Sweden and Finland into the alliance and said, by the way, there's room for more. This is an historic day for Finland, for Sweden, for NATO, and for Euro-Atlantic security. While minutes from the FOMC meeting last month did nothing to suggest that the Fed is looking to back off of its tightening path, regardless of the recession risk. In recent uh, discussions, Powell has been very, very clear that, uh, that he understands they have a big problem and they need to be more and more restrictive. In the midst of the turmoil, the great and the good of media and tech gathered for their annual Sun Valley retreat, with Discovery's David Zaslav saying the downturn could be good for his media behemoth. A lot of turmoil in the business, but that means I think a lot of opportunity. And with all that, the week still wasn't over, with U.S. jobs numbers on Friday coming in higher than anticipated in number and a bit lower in wage growth, indicating that the economy is still strong, much stronger, as it turned out, than Elon Musk's promise to buy Twitter. Because Friday evening, we learned that Mr. Musk had thought better of the deal he'd offered and was calling the whole thing off. Well, what did the markets make of all this wild week? Well, stocks were up, with the S&P 500 higher by just under 2 percent and the Nasdaq rising 4.6 percent, while bonds sold off a bit, leaving the 10-year yield just above 3 percent rather than just under as it was last week. And the dollar posted another week of gains. Here to help us sort it all out are Liz Ann Saunders, chief strategist for Charles Schwab and Anna Lee. Causeway Capital Management Fundamental Portfolio Manager. So let me start, Lizanne, if I could with you. When it comes to the economy, which is what investors really want to know about, what did we learn from the markets this week on the economy? So, I, you know, if we start with today and the jobs number, um, I don't want to say on the surface it was uh, strong. I think there was you could you could nitpick a little bit with the average work week down, as you mentioned, David, wages uh, coming down. But I think that the shift in the market maybe had less to do with some change in outlook for the economy um, because you just sort of, for whatever reason, saw speculative juices sort of kick in again, the leadership back in those highly speculation driven lower quality segments of the market, which at this point looks a little bit more like your typical bear market rally where you see just some counter trend moves versus some you know, new assessment of either the inflation or the uh, economic landscape. And I'm not sure the, the jobs data changed that to any significant degree either. So, so Ellen, what about from your point of view as, a, as an investor here? Uh, is it time to say maybe there is an area for a bear market rally or is this just a tiny blip? I believe, you know, the real earnings hit 
will come in second half as we're seeing, we're hearing from companies, especially retailers saying they're already seeing weakness uh, from consumers. And I believe this is a, a tiny blip. Rates are up, you know, investment sentiment is down and consumers, especially to the middle, to the lower level of the income level, they're getting squeezed and we're already seeing consumer uh, down trading today. Lizanne, what about the consumer? It's pulled us through so many times before. It's such a large portion of the U.S. economy. Can we count on the consumer yet again? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. I, I don't know that we see a, a significant implosion. But what you're seeing in the data already is a slowdown in demand, a slowdown of spending, especially in the stay-at-home area, the goods-oriented side of the economy, which if there's a silver lining, that bodes well for those components of metrics like CPI and inflation, because that was the breeding ground for the inflation problem with which we're still dealing. So that's a, a positive sign. You know, There's this debate out there about excess savings and, and the strength of household balance sheets. David, we talked about that earlier today. And the only rub with that analysis, if you do it in the aggregate, it doesn't pick up the fact that most of that call it excess savings, is concentrated up the income spectrum. And that's where the wealth effects of the net worth decline, courtesy of the bear market, as well as housing, comes into play. And then you look at the lower end and you see the increase in revolving credit. That's not a, a good sign when just to fund your day-to-day -day expenses requires taking on a bit more uh, credit card debt. So I, I think the, the surge that was represented by the consumer in the economy coming out of the lockdowns, I think that's that's very much in the review. Ellen, what about the component parts of the spending? Because coming out of the lockdown, as Lizanne was just talking about, it was mainly goods. Are we seeing services spending now really pick up the slack and maybe carry us through? I think, you know, we heard from companies like Walmart and Target saying the merchandise side of sales have you know, turned uh, the other way. And in terms of services, you know, we're also seeing a lot of travel cancellations or, you know, a lot of congestion at airports, meaning there is still service demand on the services side of consumer demand. Yet, you know, that's something that can turn very quickly. And I think the other, you know, we had a good jobs report today, but unlike three months ago, we're also seeing headlines, you know, companies, especially on the tech side, are you know eliminating jobs so i don't think you know things are you know we, we're in for a more difficult time for sure and going back to you know your question about how consumers are doing we're also hearing from retailers how they've actually stocked up inventory during a time when demand was starting to fall so i think from a corporate earnings perspective for a lot of these retailers, we're going to see a squeeze, and that's not going to be really pretty at all. Uh, so, yeah, and so David, Ellen makes a good point about um, the, the demand side of the equation and payrolls. Payrolls are a coincident indicator, and I think especially given the potential inflection point we sit in, we have to start looking at those, not even just leading indicators like unemployment claims, which on a four week average are up almost 70,000 from the low, but the leading leading indicators. And that's where you're starting to stack up more than just anecdotal evidence, whether it's the announcements of hiring freezes, um, job cut announcements, all of those um, happen before you get the pickup in claims, which in turn then leads to the down the, the downfall in payrolls, and the last thing to sort of fall or rise, in the case of the unemployment rate, are those lagging indicators. And I, I think that may suggest that the we, we may be in this sort of final window of pretty strong payroll numbers if we continue to see that evidence stack up. So, Lizanne, let's be honest. One, sorry, go ahead, please, Ellen. Uh, one other thing I wanted to add is, you know, we're talking about inflation. Maybe energy prices are starting to flatten out a little bit and control over inflation may start. But I think another concern that I have is housing costs tend to, um, you know, lag from the period of interest rate hikes. So, you know, taking into account shelter costs is a big component of the price index, you know, that's another pressure that's going to still, you know, continue to weigh in on consumers, again, putting more pressure on consumer sentiment and wallets.
Lizanne, one of the reasons we look at all these numbers so carefully is to try to figure out what the Fed is likely to do. Is the path of the Fed over the next two, three, four months basically baked in? And particularly, let me ask you, we got CPI numbers next week, we got retail sales numbers. Is that likely to change the Fed's mind? So I think 75 is is almost assuredly baked in for the July meeting and probably either 50 or 75 at the September meeting. But that trajectory and how the markets are pricing in, whether it's 50, whether it's 75, will be somewhat dependent on the data we get between the July meeting and the September meeting. And there's another payroll report. There's the inflation uh, data. And I, I would expect that you would have to see not just an easing in inflation, but the combination of an easing in inflation and deterioration in the labor market that forces the Fed to put now their focus on both of their mandates. Right now, they are almost solely focused on the inflation mandate. But if we saw that improvement in inflation deteriorate in the labor market, they, they may have to sort of temper some of the more hawkish language. But I think it would only be if the combination of those things happened. Ellen Lizan makes such a good point about the tightness in the labor market, and it takes me back to the question about recession. Been a lot of talk about the danger of recession over the next year or two years even. At the same time, I'm not sure we can have a recession with full employment. Given the tightness, should we really be thinking about recession at all? I think it is totally relevant to talk about recession because as Lizanne said, you know, in terms of payroll numbers, I do agree with her assessment. We're sort of at the last point. And just as I mentioned before, you know, companies, as demand falls, they will tighten and, um, you know, tighten their headcount as well, which means that I don't think the job market is going to be as robust as it, it is today. And hence, you know, when a full recession does come, it will be driven by the fact that there's slower growth and people are losing jobs. And that's going to really accelerate inflation coming down, at which point the Fed will have to focus on an employment number as well as inflation. And David, if you go back and you look at, at all modern day recessions and you look at where payrolls were at the start of the recession, which of course doesn't get dated until well after the fact, but the nature of how recessions are dated, the NBER, when they declare we're in one, in order to date when it started by month, they go back to the peak in the aggregate data they track, including payroll. So in fact, if you look at even the back-to-back -back brutal recessions in the early 80s, the, the really tough mid-70s recession, payrolls were not only high, they continued to rise in the early part of the recession. And the average increase in the unemployment rate heading into a recession is only three tenths. In fact, if you look at a chart of the unemployment rate, it's always at or near its low point at the start and at or near its high point and typically still rising at the end. So you just have to understand mm -hmm. the whole notion of peaks in the data. We don't know now that we're at a peak, but you ultimately get to that point and then they backdate the start to the peak. It's such a good point. Thank you so much. Lizanne Saunders and Ellen Lee will be staying with us as we turn to some investment advice in a somewhat conflicted market. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. But even the slowdown seemed to be slowing down. While the mixed news there carried some unexpected blessings, such as a temporary drop in the unemployment rate, the hope that the recession might squeeze out substantial amounts of inflation seemed to be generally fading, even in the government's forecasts. And so, with eminently good cause to panic and crash, the stock market, that perverse little devil, rallied and surged. And that was the way Louis Rickheiser saw it on Wall Street Week in the, back in the fall of 1979 when we were trying to address a much bigger beast of inflation and looking for an economic downturn to do the trick. Lizanne Saunders of Charles Schwab and Ellen Lee of Causeway Capital Management have stayed with us. So Ellen, let me start to you, with you about specific investment advice because I came across this and find it intriguing idea of idiosyncratic self-help, I think you call it. What does that tell us about a company? So basically at Causeway, we're looking at companies on a bottom-up basis. So I'm trying to find you know, risk reward where we're taking a conservative view on the outlook of the company, but there are things within the control of the company where the company can increase its earnings and better the 
business model of the company. So an example I will use here is a company called Unilever, you know, based in UK slash Netherlands, a massive com uh, consumer company. They recently had Nelson Peltz, a shareholder activist, come in and join the board. And this is actually great news because the restructuring that they had take on themselves you know, is going to be accelerated by a shareholder, minority shareholder advocate to push things forward. They had not been as good as pushing the innovations as uh, in a timely manner. We believe an activist being there will really push the management to accelerate that timetable. And this has nothing to do with the economic slowdown we talked about in the previous segment because they're doing things internally to really energize their sales and ultimately increase earnings of the company. So Lizanne, let me put that in somewhat different terms, which Ellen may <laughs> agree with or disagree with. You know, we say a rising tide lifts all boats. I think what she's saying is that when the tide's not going up, you have to find some boats that float a little better than other boats do. Uh, what are you looking for, Lizanne, in terms of advising people on investments right now? Yeah, so we have, we've really been taking more of a factor-based approach versus say either a sector-based approach or trying to pick your traditional style boxes of, of large cap, small cap growth value. And really what the theme has been around the factors we've been emphasizing is sort of a quality wrapper um, and almost hybrid factors where, where you look for reasonable value, but, but also especially in what we think, and, and I know Ellen agrees, we're go heading into I think a more earnings constrained environment. So when that happens, earnings become more dear and there's more value then to companies that have that higher profitability, have that positive earnings revisions trend while also keeping in mind the need to have strong free cash flow, healthy balance sheet with high cash, low debt. You, you sort of look at the macro picture, see what's lacking and then look for companies uh, that have that in relative terms. And you can apply factor-based analysis or factor-based screening and Bloomberg has great data on factors across the spectrum of large cap, small cap. Um, you can look for growth characteristics in stocks that live in the value indexes and vice versa. So I, I think it's, you're less constrained when you take a factor approach than if you're just trying to make a sector call or two. Let me put a geographic lens on this, if I could. And Alan, I'll start with you here. Uh, what about Europe? What about China? Some people or investors are saying right now, China is a good place, for example, to look because they're loosening monetary policy at the same time the rest of the world is tightening it. I think in you know China recently there's been a lot of bad news priced in because of the regulatory risk and the COVID policy. And as an investor myself, looking at companies on a bottom-up basis, you know the fact that there is you know they have they're in a loosening policy. Plus, you know hopefully in in the foreseeable future the zero COVID policy goes away. I think there are companies like Macau casino operators, like Las Vegas Sands or Sands China, that could really benefit from a reopening of the country. And hence, you know, we find those opportunities to be uh, very attractive in the current time. And in the case of Europe, you know, Euro, you, you mentioned earlier in the segment, you know, dollar's never been stronger. And now, you know, with Europe, what it's faced with the Ukraine uh, situation, there's gonna be a lot of fiscal spending to beef up its infrastructure. I know there's a lot of concerns about recession because energy prices are going up, but if you are able to find companies where they're gonna be beneficiaries of more spending because energy infrastructure has to, go, uh, has to be beefed up, you will find good opportunities in those markets as well. Lizanne, opportunities geographically? So I think th there's still probably some storms that are going to ha have to be weathered uh, globally uh, with, with bouts of volatility, especially given what's going on in currency markets and not to mention the, the war and the impact on the consumption side of economies in, uh, in Europe. But I think thinking from a more secular standpoint, longer term, I think when we, whenever we do come out of this I like to think of as a dual cycle when we're through the bear market, when we're through the recession that that I think is either happening or will happen. What tends to happen when you come out of those dual cycles, especially if they're global in nature, is you tend to see a, a change in, in where leadership resides from a macro perspective. And it is our view that we're going to see more 
the greater benefits of diversification outside the United States. That's different than saying we think, you know, non-U.S. is going to handily outperform U.S., but there hasn't been that benefit of that global diversification. We think that's the next secular shift. Lizanne, I can't let you go without asking about Elon Musk and Twitter here. I know you don't like to invest by sectors. Does that phenomenon tell us anything about the sector of tech, or is it, should I use the word idiosyncratic when it comes to Elon Musk? I don't think it's it's a news flash that he's a bit of a quirky guy. So uh, I think making a broader inference about the the industry, um, at least at this point, I think is a, is a stretch. I think it is more idiosyncratic. That's the popular word of our segments here today. <laughs> Does that sound right to you, Ellen? <laughs> Totally agree. Okay, that's nice to end on a note of agreement here. Many <laughs> thanks now to Ellen Lee of Causeway Capital Management and also to Liz Ann Saunders of Charles Schwab. Coming up, we're going to take a look ahead at the world next week on Global Wall Street. This is Wall Street Week, and we are on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now to take a look at what's coming up next week on Global Wall Street, starting with Julia Sally in Singapore. Thanks, David. China's second quarter GDP is likely to contract due to Shanghai's lockdown and China's overall COVID zero policy, although June activity data should show the economy starting to bounce. Elsewhere, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is likely to deliver another big rate hike to fight inflation. And the tension between inflation and growth and that narrow path in between will be on full display at the G20 meetings in Bali. It is a tussle between G20 central bankers whose fight against exploding prices could trigger recession and finance ministers whose main object is to avoid that. Now over to Danny Berger in London. Danny. Thanks, Juliet. Politics will take center stage in Europe, specifically in the UK in the week to come. That follows Boris Johnson uh, announcing his intention to resign as prime minister. He has said he will stay on as caretaker. But now what follows will be a conservative effort to find a new leader of the party, a new leader of the government at the same time. Uh, there's been some pushback in terms of what that timetable might look like. We will get more details on that throughout the week. Of course, whoever takes the reins will also have to grapple with uh, economic woes throughout the country. Now over to Romain Bostic in New York. Thanks, Danny. The latest U.S. inflation reading is out next Wednesday with the Consumer Price Index projected to show an 8.8% annual gain for June. That follows an 8.6% rate in May and would be the 14th straight month where year-over-year -year headline inflation has been at or above 5%. Meanwhile, keep an eye out for the release of a separate broad index of price pressures that Jerome Powell himself has said contributed to the Fed's recent decision to boost interest rates by 75 basis points. The so-called Index of Common Inflation Expectations is a more thorough reading than CPI, but is only updated once per quarter. Next Friday's update will almost certainly show a massive rise in inflation expectations. And that has investors now looking to the upcoming earnings season to gauge whether corporate profits are holding up against that surge in prices. According to data compiled by Bloomberg, earnings growth for the S&P as a whole is projected to have risen about 4% in the second quarter, though the majority of those gains are expected to come from energy and industrial stocks with banks and consumer discretionary companies projected to show declines. That earnings season officially starts next week with reports from JP Morgan, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, Delta Airlines, PepsiCo, and United Health. David? Thanks to Julia Sally, Danny Berger, and Romain Boston. Coming up, the economic slowdown is hitting the public markets hard, but what's going on behind the scenes in venture capital? We ask Deborah Jackson of Plum Valley. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Whether you call it a recession. There's probably close to a 50-50 chance, maybe it's a bit less than that, that we've had 
two negative quarters in a row. Or not. I think there's nothing inevitable about this recession. There is no question at this point that the economy is slowing, changing the world, whether it's the world of stocks. We're pretty close. You know, it's um, it's sort of a, a losing game to call the bottom of the market. Or of credit. Spreads were, again, uh, much lower than you might look at from a 10-year average relative to economic outcomes. But what about the world of patient capital? Capital directed toward long-term innovation. Capital that's meant to change the world. President Biden's special climate envoy, John Kerry, thinks that there's a lot of money in venture capital still headed toward new technologies directed to the energy transition. It is appropriate, I think, to have a gas transition while you bring technology to scale that is going to change altogether what we're doing. And frankly, there's about a trillion dollars of venture capital already moving towards these new technologies. But others, like Vinod Kosla of Kosla Ventures, think the downturn will have to affect at least the more vulnerable venture capital firms. So I do think, given the hype we've seen the last five years, we will see a decline in returns. The good firms continue to be disciplined about valuations, but uh, I do think in general for the industry we'll see a decline. The best firms will still do well. Deborah Jackson is at the very center of venture capital with a firm that she founded and now runs. It's called Plum Alley, and we welcome her now to Wall Street Week. Great to have you here, Deborah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, David. So the big question is, there's a downturn, without a doubt. Uh, you look at the markets, whether it's equities or debt or whatever, downturn. Is it affecting venture capital? And if so, how? Well, the big macro issues that we're facing in the public markets, like inflation, um, supply chain challenges, and also things like the recent Supreme Court ruling that would affect EPA regulations, all of those factors come into play for the public markets. They also have implications in the private markets. However, the private markets are very, very different. So the private markets, when you think of venture, investors are looking at the medium term time frame, not like short day-to-day -day trading and immediate effects, but more over a course of seven years for a series A level financing. And so there are, it's a, it's a medium term kind of investor mentality that's happening. I think it's important to know that there is so much money that's been put out into venture capital over the last few years. In 2021, we had a record amount. It was 97% over the previous year. So you think about it. We have this huge amount of capital that's already been deployed into early stage companies. We also have about 600, 330 million billion of dry powder that's already been raised and ready to deploy. So what does that mean? That really means that these venture firms, early stage companies, have a lot of fuel in the tank to keep going, to weather this current market situation. Does that large amount of money, even huge amount of money, make your job more difficult? You're looking presumably for really great opportunities. Yes. Uh, if there are a lot of people in there, uh, maybe, maybe not as disciplined as Plum Alley is, what does that mean to valuations? Are people overbidding? Do you have a tough time finding uh, proper prices for what you want yes. to invest in? Yes. So at Plum Alley, we're very, very focused on the fundamentals. And I come from Wall Street. I spent 20 years on Wall Street at Goldman and other places, as do my team members. So we come at looking at venture from a kind of fundamental point of view, which means do the companies have revenue? Do they have real customers? Do they have a real product that we need in the world? If the answer to that is yes, then you drill down and look at the numbers. And in our case, the companies that we funded have revenues, but we only look at you know, six to seven times current revenues for a SaaS company. Hmm. And in the market, that number has been about 12 times revenues. So we have seen this situation where valuations have been way overpriced. Um, and I think that's a reflection of the fact there is so much capital coming into the market. When there's a lot of capital in the market, it pumps up valuations. But that's also presumably part of why there's a lot of dry powder, because if, you, if you're only willing to go seven yes. times and people are spending 12 times, you don't spend the money. You have to sit on your money until you find the proper valuation. Where are the opportunities that you find right now that make sense? 
Well, we, we've invested now 65 million in 27 companies. So we've been at this for five years. So we have had the opportunity to see the market change over time. But we have stuck to our knitting. We have stuck to the fundamentals, which is do, what are the revenues? What is the company actually doing? Is the company essential for our future survival and for more productivity in industry? Does it really matter versus companies that are sort of optional, like dog walking apps? If you're looking for transformation, because it sounds like that's what you're looking for, fundamental yes. transformation, basic changes in our society, in our economy, where are you looking? Is that energy uh, transition? A lot of people are doing that. Is that biotech? What yes. sectors do you look at? So three quarters of our portfolio is in frontier technologies. So think of robotics, think about AI, think about sensors that are monitoring, monitoring climate. And then 30% is in healthcare. So CRISPR gene editing, um, uh, therapeutics that have never been introduced in the market before. So we like that combination because we think there needs to be Innovation is happening in every sector. It's not limited to healthcare. It's not limited to industry. It's not limited to human beings. It sounds like you're sort of swinging for the fences, as it were. I mean, you're looking for the big home run. And that means you will have more yes. strikes, almost necessarily. Yes. Uh, there's a risk involved in that yes. huge reward at the same time. Yes. How do you balance that ability to really get a home run against what you just said? A lot of companies in, how is there a moat around these companies? Yes, there is, and the companies, and I can speak to the companies we've invested in, there is a proprietary technology. They own IP. It's one of the things that we look for. And these are hard technologies. It's like what we've invested in a company, OnRide, that is autonomous and electric freight vehicles. They are bordering on 100 million of ARR. They are, Maersk is one of their big clients, Oatly, GE. Um, uh, appliances, etc. So, so these are companies that have have the fundamentals to show growth. We were very smart to do those fundamentals when we invested at a Series A level, and many of our companies are, you know, very much are, are unicorns at this point, and there's still more time to go. So it's never over until the money's in the bank. I want to come back to the downturn, if I can call it that yes. way. Certainly, we're seeing the markets right now. You mentioned IPOs before, the yes. possibility of IPO. Yes. IPOs don't look as certain today as they did two, three, four years ago, when it yes. was almost you couldn't get out of the way of the money, essentially. Is that dampening at all your ardor for some of these companies? Because the IPO exit may not be there when you get there. I think, you know, if you, if you look at the time horizon of being seven years for Series A level early stage companies, there is still some time left on the companies we've invested in. We've invested in the last three to four years. So we know there's still some time to go before they're positioned for IPO. Some of our companies have accelerated and, you know, that time frame has shortened. But, you know, will the market be there? In my opinion, you, you, look, at, look at history. When really strong companies are ready to come to market, they will have the opportunity. It may not be every company, and it may be maybe six months or a year later. But where is the world going? I mean, the world is going to these technologies, to adopting these technologies, because they bring value. They bring value. They bring efficiency. They bring more productivity. They deal with the workforce. They deal with fixing our climate issues. So why is so much capital poured into this sector? Because people see the future is technology, and they want to have a piece of that. Is it risky? Of course it's risky. But don't tell me the public markets aren't risky at this point. <laughs> so it, it's risky, but it's risk versus return. And what do you do to mitigate some of the risk? You wait till the companies are a little bit further along. Mm -hmm. You do your diligence. Mm -hmm. You kick the tires. You understand if they have a competitive moat. You understand if they own IP. And you understand, do they have to be in the world? If you have a company that does not need to be in the world, that is a risky company. Our companies need to be in the world, and we have deep conviction on that. So matter of time, we'll see. But I'd love to come back and share with you when we have those returns well, and exits. Please do, and I don't doubt the conviction. I can feel the conviction, believe me. <laughs> Deborah Jackson, thank you so much for joining us. Deborah Jackson is with Plum Alley. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We are joined once again this week by our very special contributor to Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, thanks so much for your coming to us, actually, from Sun Valley. It's good of you to do. Uh, we've lost, it strikes me, two world leaders, in a sense, this week in very different circumstances. Boris Johnson, of course, forced to step down as prime minister of the United Kingdom. But then at the end of the week, we lost to an assassin's bullet. Shinzo Abe, the longest serving Japanese prime minister in history. I, I wonder, is this telling us anything larger about the state of the world when we have these sorts of events in a single week? You know, what the assassination of Shinzo Abe in Japan is a tragedy. It is a tragedy for his family. It is a tragedy for uh, Japan. It is a tragedy for the Japanese-American relationship, which is a linchpin of our whole approach uh, to Asia. Ultimately, I think it is a uh, global uh, tragedy. And I have to think about what it represents. And it represents a manifestation of a kind of swirling anger uh, that seems far too pervasive in our politics almost everywhere in the world. In a very different way, Brexit, Boris Johnson's ascendancy represents that kind of swirling anger and his ultimately falling uh, from power is a product of these kinds of divisions. And, we certainly see this uh, in our own country with the question of orderly succession of power on uh, the table, with the bitter controversies that surround uh, the uh, Supreme Court. And so I think ultimately all of us have to reckon with uh, this uh, rage um, that seems to be a feature that cuts across uh, very, very many uh, societies. And that is going to be a, uh, a framing uh, aspect as we discuss the more narrow particulars of economic policy going forward. Larry, it strikes me that uh, former Prime Minister Abe had a fairly profound, I believe, macroeconomic effect, unlike a lot of prime ministers and that matter presidents, even had it named after him, Abenomics. What was Abenomics, and in the end, did it work? Abenomics was an attempt uh, to jolt uh, the Japanese economy out of two decades of uh, secular stagnation and disinflation with radically expansionary policy, both on the fiscal side and on the monetary side, and with uh, structural policies like major efforts to get women working and enfranchised in uh, the labor force. And I, I think one would have to say that it was a success by the standards of what had come before, but it was not a fully mission uh, accomplished in terms of what was happening uh, in uh, Japan, but I think it will be remembered as one of the more aggressive and successful reprogrammings of macroeconomic strategy that we've seen in a long time. And if, as I fear, um, after this current inflationary episode, the issues of absorbing savings, secular stagnation that we've talked about on and off on uh, this show recur in Europe and in the United States, then I think that Abenomic legacy will be studied very, very carefully because in some sense, Japan was the first to experience uh, the challenge of demographic uh, contraction and of excess saving, but it may not ultimately be the last. Bringing it back to the United States and some of those questions you just mentioned about inflation, uh, we got jobs numbers at the end of this week, uh, higher in the terms of the overall addition to jobs, at the same time a little lower than was expected by some, at least, in the wage increases. What did you make of the jobs numbers? 
Look, I think we have a very ambiguous uh, economy uh, right now. We've got indicators of strength in many in many sectors, particularly travel and uh, services. This was a strong employment report once again in, a, in an economy where the labor force only grows by 50 or 75,000 people a month. You can't forever be creating 375,000 uh, jobs. Uh, there's nothing here to suggest uh, that uh, the economy is currently collapsing into a uh, recession. And we certainly could have seen a wage inflation number that was much more alarming. And so from that point of view, I think there was a little bit of reassurance on uh, inflation here. But we still have a very ambiguous uh, picture. I don't think that this changes fundamentally the picture we had uh, coming in, that uh, interest rates are still considerably below where they're going to need to be, that the economy has very considerable uh, inflation uh, risks, and that the Fed has the challenge of trying to achieve as soft a landing as uh, possible in an airplane that's on a very complicated kind of trajectory. So I think that most people are saying there's little in these jobs numbers that would indicate to the Federal Reserve that they should back off, at least yet, the rate hikes. Do you agree with that? And what factors should they be looking at as they determine whether, in fact, and when they should back off? I think that there's nothing here that should change somebody's mind in a major way about what monetary policy is going to need to need to do at the next meeting or at uh, probably the meeting uh, after uh, the next uh, meeting. I think what would uh, start to change things would uh, be very strong evidence that the economy was slowing substantially in an across-the-board way with respect to consumption and uh, investment demand. I think if you saw a precipitous decline in the level of uh, vacancies and level of labor turnover, that would be an indicator that I would be watching. But as long as we're in almost unprecedented, we're actually unprecedented territory in terms of the ratio of job openings to uh, unemployed people, I don't think we can stop being uh, concerned about uh, inflation. So, so, Larry, something I'm curious about uh, from you as an economist, is it possible to have a recession when we have full employment or very close to full employment? Uh, or uh, another way to put it is, do we have to have a precipitous fall in employment or rise in unemployment before we really should be very concerned about recession? I think it would be hard to imagine a recession in which you didn't have some meaningful increase in uh, unemployment. It's not something we have ever seen uh, before. And in some ways, the very definition of recession is a broad gauge to uh, sustain decline in economic activity. And the act of hiring and working is the central part of that economic activity. So could we see two quarters in a row with GDP decline? Yeah, I do think it's possible that we'll see that uh, between the first and two quarters, second quarters of this year. But would that be something that we would think about as a recession in the classical sense if it wasn't coupled with employment statistics different from the ones we've seen? I don't think the National Bureau of Economic Research would or should label that a recession. So how concerned at this point are you about a recession, Larry? I still think uh, the dominant prospect is that we will have a recession in, uh, within the next uh, year or two. I think the chances that it has already begun look a little bit diminished to me relative to what I would have guessed several weeks uh, ago. Not impossible, but I think more unlikely than I would have judged 
uh, several weeks ago from the recent numbers. Larry, it's always so helpful to hear from you. Thank you so much. That's Larry Summers, our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. He is, of course, from Harvard University. Coming up, is Jeff Bezos lobbying for a job on the Council of Economic Advisors? And by the way, is he qualified? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Suddenly, everyone's an expert on the economy. When President Biden first proposed that massive $1.9 trillion American rescue plan back in January of 2021, our own special contributor Larry Summers was first to say that it was just too big, particularly coming after two earlier rounds. You're talking about something that relative to the GDP gap is six times as large. But White House economists said it was needed and would not be inflationary, given the state of the problem and of the economy. The risks of doing too little far outweigh the risks of doing too much. And Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell, who, by the way, is trained as a lawyer, not an economist, stuck with the transitory claim as long as he could before finally admitting that he had been wrong. What did we get wrong? And that really was looking at these supply side issues and believing that they would be resolved relatively quickly. But at least that was a bunch of economists disagreeing with one another. Now we're going way past those trained in the dark arts of economics. Inflation rules the game. Inflation fears are in your head. Inflation is high. Inflation, that's the bigger problem right now. It is understandable that the president has to weigh in on the issues. So last week, Mr. Biden, who by the way is a lawyer, took to Twitter to explain why he thought gas prices are too high blaming the companies reaping record profits. I call on the companies to pass this along every penny of this 18 cent reduction to the consumers. But then Jeff Bezos, whose degrees are in electrical engineering and computer science, decided to give the president a lecture on economics, responding again on Twitter, calling Biden's words misdirection or a deep misunderstanding, which in turn led John Kirby from the White House, who's a retired rear admiral trained in international relations and national security, to spring to the president's defense. Anybody that knows President Biden knows he's plain spoken, and he tells you exactly what he's thinking and in, in, in terms that everybody can understand. So I think we obviously take great exception at the idea that this is somehow misdirection. And not to be left out of all the fun, President Vladimir Putin of Russia apparently decided to impose his own solution for inflation by imposing an excess profits tax on Gazprom without all that fancy economic talk. In the end, it is easy for those of us to second guess those who are making the decisions, particularly when they seem to be going wrong or at least have unintended consequences, which brings us back to that font of so much wisdom from over a century ago. It was former President Teddy Roosevelt at the Sorbonne in 1910 who said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. There is no question that President Biden, the one now in Roosevelt's arena, has dared greatly when it comes to the economy. Now we all have to hope, for all of our sake, that there's triumph at the end of this rocky road. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.